early on in my research for the exhibition, I attended a presentation by the nonprofit organization Open Style Lab. We're gonna hear more about the lab this afternoon, but what they do is create clothing solutions for people with diverse abilities. They pair designers with clients and over the course of several weeks come up with a product that addresses a specific challenge a client faces in daily life. When I visited them back in 2016, I was very much struck by one of the clients who got up to speak at the end of her group's presentation, wearing the coat that they had designed for her. She was quite moved and expressed how she had had the most incredible experience at the lab because before, she had always felt like her body was wrong and the clothes were right. This really stuck with me. How many of us have had this feeling to one degree or another? Buying a garment in a store or online, trying it on, we can't get it on, it doesn't fit, we can't move in it, and we feel terrible about ourselves. We try to fit our bodies to the clothes, to the ideals we see promoted in the magazines and the media, rather than the other way around. Rather than, even as an industry, thinking of clothing as something that's supposed to fit bodies that's supposed to enable our bodies, to work with our bodies, and indeed to celebrate our bodies. It's not our bodies that are wrong, it is the current fashion system that is flawed. Now, of course, there's been a growing cultural conversation about the need for greater body diversity in the fashion industry, and also body positivity in general. My hope with this exhibition, and also today's proceedings, is, is that the exhibition can contribute a historical perspective to the discourse. It can help us understand how we arrived where we are today. Because I truly believe that until we understand how the current system developed, we can't begin to fix it and affect permanent change. And this issue isn't just about size. This is about age, ability, mobility, race, and gender identity. And each of these issues will be touched on in today's conversations. At its core, the exhibition examines the history of the idealized fashion body. The ideal fashion body is a cultural construct. It shifts and changes throughout history to emphasize different shapes and proportions. We can see this in the design of garments, in the way a designer uses certain strategies to draw the eye to areas of the body, both concealing but also revealing. For example, by changing the placement of a waistline, the fullness of a sleeve, the volume of a skirt. So in part, this is a history of silhouette. But this issue goes far beyond silhouette. It is about body politics, about how bodies have been portrayed and treated by the fashion industry, about how certain bodies have been celebrated, but also how others have been marginalized and even stigmatized. In the exhibition, which is across the street, and I hope all of you guys will have the opportunity to go check it out today, uh, the garments are paired with images from the fashion press, the popular media, film clips, videos, workout videos, and other digital elements to demonstrate how this issue permeates across culture and society. As can be seen here, the exhibition begins in the 18th century and then flows chronologically to culminate in a display of looks by contemporary designers who embrace a more inclusive vision of the fashionable body in their work and I believe are setting an example for the industry. Among them are Christian Siriano, Becca McCarran Tran of Chromat, and Lucy Jones, and I'm thrilled that each one of them are here to speak a bit more about their work today. When you first enter the gallery, visitors are greeted with a display of dress forms on the very first platform. At the center is Martin Margiela's dress form tunic, hovering, almost floating above the platform. Surrounding the Margiela piece are historical dress forms from the 18th and 19th century. These, from, I'm sorry, from the 19th and 20th century. The Martin Margiela piece is Margiela's comment on the artificial nature of the fashionable ideal. Instead of tricking the eye through silhouette, it literally transforms the model's body into a dress form, into a tool used during the fashion design process to drape and fit garments. 
The juxtaposition of the Margiela piece with the historical dress forms is here to demonstrate how much even the ideal dress form shape is a historical construct. It too has changed throughout history. As visitors move through the space, they'll immediately see that all of the objects are dressed on dress forms throughout the show. I made this decision very consciously for two reasons. One is because dress forms, given that they don't have heads or often arms and legs, they make the garment the focal point of the display. It seems almost floating on the platform. But dress forms themselves are also an integral part of the fashion design process. And they're deeply related to the relationship between designed garments and the bodies that wear them. When considering fashion and physique, garments cannot be separated from what they're dressed on, even in the space of the museum. With the Margiela display, I wanted to address this issue head on in the very first room of the gallery so that the dress forms become as much a part of the history and the consideration of the display as the garments themselves. For some of the pieces on view, our conservation team did incredible work building out specific forms for the garments. These images here were taken by our conservator Marjorie Jonas as she built out the form for a 1913 evening dress. We did this very consciously in order to highlight and celebrate the wearers of these garments, the original wearers. We did this because there is a common misconception that all women in the past were thinner than we are today. That they were all one size, that all women in the 19th century had 18 inch wasp waists. And this is just not true. Body diversity has existed throughout history. No two bodies are the same and our bodies go through many different stages throughout our lifetimes. So for this exhibition, we wanted to embrace this diversity and through the display highlight the diversity of sizes contained within our collection that span from across history. One issue that recurs throughout the display is the issue of how fashionable silhouettes are translated into impossible body standards in the fashion press. This is displayed in 2D materials such as the book seen here, but also in different fashion plates and imagery on the walls of the exhibition and on iPads throughout the display. We can understand how the body is manipulated quite easily when looking at fashion plates from the 18th and 19th century where illustrators used pen and paper to manipulate the body. In a particular example from the 1830s which echoes a pair of garments on display, the proportions are exaggerated to an unnatural degree. The man's and woman's waists are drawn smaller than their heads, the shoulders are impossibly broad, the feet impossibly small, such extreme manipulation still occurs today, but is, it is much more difficult to detect due to advancements in photo manipulating software like Photoshop. I'm about to play a clip, another short clip from a video on display in the exhibition that demonstrates the extreme alterations that can be achieved using programs like this. This video was created in 2011 to advocate for legislation that would require advertisements to include a warning label alerting viewers that the image had been altered. Uh, such legislation has come up in debate again and hopefully we'll see some movement with it, but it's not just imagery from the fashion media that impacts how we think about good and bad bodies, how we judge bodies. It's also about how clothing, how fashion is used throughout the popular press, throughout popular culture, to judge bodies, to critique bodies. And this is particularly apparent in depictions of so-called fashion victims, women rendered ridiculous by their clothing. 
Here are a couple of examples of satirical cartoons from the 18th and 19th centuries that are on view within the exhibition. On the left, in an illustration titled A Little Tighter, a woman is forcefully pulled into stays by a notably slimmer man. Here, it is not the stays that are being portrayed as unfashionable, but her body. The joke being that no matter how hard the man pulls, no matter how tight the stays become, she will never be successful in looking fashionable because of her physique. Similarly, a cartoon from the British satirical publication Punch uses fashionable dress to mock women because of their age. At the center, we see a young woman asking her grandmother if she can try on a similar shoulder-bearing style of dress, to which her grandmother scoffs, saying, don't be ridiculous, you would look a fright. However, here, the joke is placed firmly on the grandmother, for it is implied that it's the younger woman's physique that is actually more appropriate to show off, while the older woman is frightening, grotesque. This issue of what is appropriate or inappropriate underlies a lot of our attitudes towards bodies. And I believe a number of our speakers later today are gonna to touch on this in different ways, but what constitutes a fashionable body isn't as simple as thin versus not thin. It cuts deeper to social views on modesty, propriety, and what is and is not considered appropriate. In 1913, caricature artist Georges Gorsat published the book Le Vrai et le Faux Chic, which quite literally means the true and the false fashionable. What we see in the subsequent illustrations are old women, short women, fat women, each rendered ridiculous by their attempt to dress fashionably, their bodies immediately comparable to the longer, leaner, younger bodies of the women Gorsa deems le vrai chic. It is not the clothing that changes between the images, but the women, making it the women, or more precisely their bodies, that are vrai ou faux, not the particular garment or ensemble. Sadly, I think we all can attest that this sentiment of these images does not feel so foreign to us. It feels very familiar. We still see body shaming thinly veiled as sartorial judgment today, in tabloids, on television, across the internet. As Laird Borelli of Vogue recently put it on a visit to the exhibition, these images prove that trolling is anything but a new phenomenon. And indeed, the internet has become the new frontier of body shaming. But it has also given rise to the grassroots body positivity movement that has disrupted and challenged the status quo in fashion. Overall, the internet and social media have completely upended the hierarchy of the fashion system. Fashion information no longer flows in a linear way from designers to magazine editors and buyers and then to consumers. Now people outside traditional fashion institutions can post images of their outfits, share style choices and tips, even comment on a brand's social media account or organize a viral campaign against a retailer that will affect their profits. There's power here. And many women and men with bodies typically excluded from the mainstream fashion press have harnessed the internet to cultivate a community that's dedicated to body positive imagery. Through their blogging, Instagram, YouTube posts, and other platforms, they challenge body image ideals and also societal norms of what is an appropriate way to dress different sized bodies. They show that bodies of all sizes and the clothes that they wear are fashionable. And they are the ones who are truly pushing this conversation forward. It's the industry that needs to listen and catch up. But while there are many designers and individuals out there who are making moves in the fashion industry today, it's important that we remember there have been points over the last 100 years when plus size fashion, for example, has been a more visible part of the mainstream fashion industry. Lauren Downing Peters, one of the scholars speaking this afternoon, will elaborate more on this later. But during the 1910s and 1920s, retailers like Lane Bryant, for example, pioneered fashionable ready-to-wear in extended sizes. Today, we would call this plus size, but then it was referred to with the darling term of stoutwear. 
We have a rare example of 1920s stoutware on view in the exhibition. Uh, just at the center here, this vibrant orange and purple evening pajama set would have likely been purchased ready-made from a higher-end department store or boutique and worn at home to entertain guests. Several decades later, during the 1980s and early 1990s, the fashion industry again witnessed a blossoming of the plus size market. And in fact, this is the period when the term plus size was institutionalized. Lane Bryant continued to be a significant force, but retailers like New York's The Forgotten Woman made headway into the mainstream fashion conversation. And high fashion labels like Givenchy, for example, began to introduce their own lines such, called Givenchy en plus. The images here are from a special advertising section that Vogue ran at this time, which was dedicated exclusively to discussing plus size fashion and its forays into the industry. But these moments of greater inclusivity or visibility, I should say, proved to be just that, moments. Moments that did not move beyond mentions, a few mentions or well-placed advertisements in the mainstream fashion press before they faded back into the margins of the industry. We need to learn this history. We need to know this history and remember this history because we need to be vigilant right now. We need to make sure that the current conversations surrounding diversity don't fade, that this doesn't become a passing trend, that we can gain strength and affect permanent change in the industry. I'd like to conclude with a quote from psychologist and leading body image expert Thomas Cash. According to Cash, our basic sense of identity as people comes from our experience in our bodies. In his own words, quote, the body is the boundary between you and everything that is not you, end quote. He explains that becoming aware of our bodies as children is how we begin to see ourselves in our own eyes. As Joanne Entwistle stated in the video clip that I played at the beginning of this talk, clothing is the way that we make our bodies social. If we cannot find clothing that fits our bodies, that works with our bodies, that celebrates our bodies, if an industry is telling us that our bodies are wrong, that is going to deeply affect our sense of identity, our sense of ourselves, and it's gonna impact how we view and treat our own bodies and view and treat the bodies of others. Everyone deserves to participate in fashion. And I hope that conversations like the ones we will be having today and the exhibition across the street can help us to one day have a truly inclusive industry. Thank you.